Welcome to Major Keys. I'm here with New York Yankees minor league hitting coach, Rachel Balkovitz. She is the first woman to be a full-time strength and conditioning coach and also is the first woman to be a full-time hitting coach in the history of professional baseball. Thank you for joining me, Rachel. Thanks for having me on. Honored. All right, we're just going to dive right in. You have 60 seconds. Can you tell me your sports journey? So I know it's a short amount of time, but if you could quickly tell me how you found sport and then to where you are right now as a hitting coach. So you yeah. start oh, when God. you're ready. Uh, 60 seconds, this is great. I mean, I actually did do this on a, on a TikTok, so I think I should be able to do it now. Okay. Basically, <laughs> um, basically, I played softball my entire life, ended up playing at uh, University of New Mexico, which is where my career ended. Had an excellent experience with strength and conditioning coaches during my my collegiate softball career, which really led me down the path of strength and conditioning. I've always been kind of a gym rat person anyway. I just love to train. And um, I was that, you know, girl on the team that did extra in the weight room. So led into a career in strength and conditioning that was really lasted for the past 10 years almost. Um, and then really the switch came to hitting coach when I decided that I wanted to be a general manager. So um I wanted to be a GM. I just want to be involved in probably like higher order organizational structure and leadership. And so the move to, to hitting coach was actually a pretty strategic move um, in the long term to just really get me more uh, experience with on field coaching um, and player evaluation from the skill standpoint and not just human performance standpoint. Uh, so I crossed over to hitting coach, and that was 2019. Um, very, very quickly. I'm probably over 60 seconds by now, but. Uh, that happened because I had been in baseball already for seven for seven years as a strength and conditioning coach and had built up a, quite a bit of um, you know con connections and uh, different colleagues and and those and mentors and one of my mentors was uh, the hitting coach a hitting coach with the Astros he got hired as a hitting coordinator with the Yankees and then ended up hiring me after I finished my second master's degree in biomechanics and statistics. I did research in eye tracking for hitters. He ended up hiring me as a hitting coach. That's awesome. So what did sports teach you growing up? Because obviously you said you played softball up yeah. through college. So like any athlete, I'm sure you picked up some things along the way that helped you get to where you are. What were those things? I mean, yeah, too many to, to list in the short amount of time we have. But I think one specific thing that really sticks out to me when you ask me that question is I was a catcher. And I was a catcher from a young age and I, I it embodied me, I embodied it. You know, I was, I was the leader of the field. I was calling out the plays. I was the one calling the outs. I was really the quarterback of the field and managing pitchers and kind of just being the leader. And I think both by um, my own personality, but also like I selected that, right? But then once I got into that role, it just really pushed me to be a leader in every situation. And so, I don't think it's any coincidence. Actually, there are now three other uh, women who are in uniform coaching and two of the other three are were catchers as well. So it's just an interesting thing that the catcher is usually, you know, it's the point guard, the quarterback, like the catcher is kind of running the show. And so I think that that really, you know, taught me a ton and kind of forced me into situations where I had to speak up. And now you are such a model for young girls who aspire to be in your position. Who were those women for you? Because obviously there was no one for you to look to when you were growing up. Yeah, there really wasn't. I think that um, what I grew up in a time, it was really fortunate that the, as I was a young girl growing up in, in sports, just when I was kind of getting to those formative years, a lot more female, a lot more women's sports were being televised. And so I wasn't even a baseball fan growing up because I actually could be a fan of college softball players because it was kind of the first time ever that college softball was being televised, you know, that wasn't on ESPN three or something um, because of the Olympics and, and Jenny Finch. And, you know, so it was getting a lot more media attention. So I could actually watch female athletes, which was the first time ever was kind of my generation as I was growing up. So that was very, I was very fortunate in that way. Um, and I would say just like Kat Osterman was one of my favorites. She was a softball player at Texas. She's still playing, going to her, I think, third Olympics. Uh, Jessica Mendoza, who I now have been able to connect with later in life as a you know colleague almost. Uh, she's a broad broadcaster for ESPN, two-time Olympian, two-time gold medalist. Um, Jenny Finch, for sure. Even Brandi Chastain, soccer player. Uh, Lisa Leslie is a more familiar name to you probably, but just women who were the earliest, earliest women who were being televised, 
even Serena and Venus, you know, just any kind of woman that was on TV, I think I was mesmerized by. And I think that getting into my professional career and, and working, there was a woman actually who was hired by the Dodgers as a physical therapist in 2007, Sue Falsoni. And I, I know exactly where I was when I found that out. It was extremely impactful. And I was a college senior when she was hired in 2007. Uh, little did I know, um, five years later, she was the first ever female physical therapist. And also, by the way, first ever woman uh, player development professional ever to be hired in 2007. And then I followed in her footsteps in 2012 and was the first ever female strength and conditioning coach to be hired. Wow. The importance of representation, being able yes. to see uh, what you want to be. And, but I do know that you did hit some obstacles early on when you were trying to break in and you weren't getting a lot of uh, responses to your resume. Uh, can you walk us through? Because I know a lot of people have a difficult time finding a job and you know the job search is arduous. But you were having a particular problem because you were a woman trying to break into a male sport. So can you just walk us through um, how you problem solve that? Yeah, so uh, basically, let, let me set the scene for you. I was uh, 2013. Um, I think it's important to note, like by that time, I had already done um, six internships, including a two-year stint at LSU as a graduate assistantship, which is way more than an internship. You know, anyone in sports knows that. As a grad assistant there, as a strength coach, I was I had two of my own teams, and I was assisting with four others. And to spend two years at a LSU SEC environment like that was just incredible. So I was a pretty um, thoroughly uh, accomplished intern, if you will. <laughs> had lots of experience. I had worked for the St. Louis Cardinals. I'd lived in the Dominican Republic. I spoke some Spanish, which is incredibly valuable working in professional baseball, where 50% of our players are Latin American. So I had a good resume, is what I'm saying. So going into 2013, I had moved to Phoenix. And in Phoenix, there are 15 teams that have their headquarters based out of Phoenix. So plenty of opportunity there and lots of jobs were posted in Phoenix for baseball. So I was going to start a PhD at the time, which I never did, but I was like, well, maybe I'll just, I'll do another summer internship. And there were tons of jobs posted. I applied for every last one of them and just got no responses. And I was like, in my naivete, I thought, oh, well, wow, these jobs are really competitive, you know? And my resume was just stacked, but I didn't know at the time because I was on the outside. So I, I was like, oh, wow, these jobs are just really competitive. So I just ended up getting a waitressing job for that season. And in spring training, I got a phone call from one of the teams and they said, hey, um, you know, one of, our, one of our coaches quit. We really need someone fast. Are you still local? Are you in Phoenix? I said, yes, I interviewed for the job. I interviewed twice. I went really well. The guy called me and said, hey, um, you're the person we wanna hire. So we'll get the paperwork started tomorrow and I'll give you a call. And then I never heard from him. And at this point, I was very, very, very naive to any kind of discrimination. I, I was just, I had no idea what was going on. So he never called. I called him, followed up every, you know, what you would do if that happened. It was very strange. Finally, he calls me a few weeks later and he said, hey, I'm really sorry. We had to go with somebody else. We can't hire you. And I just want to be honest with you. It's because you're a woman. And I thought, hmm, that's illegal, first of all. <laughs> I was like, that's weird that you would say that because that's illegal. Second of all, I just thought I was shocked, you know, and then he said, well, and I just want to let you know, also, it gets worse. I actually called around, took me so long to get back to you because I called around to the other teams that had jobs open listed on your behalf. And they also said that they had received your resume because I applied for all of them and that they were in the position to hire you. And until that point, I was very, very naive about what I was going to face getting into the game. And it hit me like a ton of bricks, but also I was so thankful that somebody was honest with me and that he said, you know, not only can I not hire you, but eight to 10 other teams also can't hire you. So I had done an internship with the St. Louis Cardinals and that was one team. And in my naive mind, I thought, oh, well, one team hired me. Why wouldn't everybody else just do the same thing? So it became really clear that I was gonna face a lot of struggles. So during that year, Ended up waitressing the entire year, worked at Lululemon part-time um, just to make money. And I, I interned at Arizona State. I did a tiny little internship with the White Sox, which really was cleaning their weight room and like doing nothing. Um, the next year coming around, I basically, this is a whole backstory to tell you what 
uh, I think you would like me to share <laughs> is that I changed my name on my resume going into that next season. Um, just to, that tells you how desperate I was, right? Like I was trying to just let you guys know, it's like, I didn't just change my name from the get go. I changed my name because I was desperate and I knew what I was up against. So I just was like, I just need to get on the phone with somebody. I need to talk to somebody to let them know like, what kind of person I am. Um, and it worked. So I actually ended up getting a phone call. I got, I uh, sent, started sending out my resume with my name as Ray instead of Rachel. And I got immediate responses. Whereas before I would just get ghosted. I had nothing, you know, back. And I got immediate responses. Hey, we're interested. We'll be in touch soon. And I finally got a phone call one day that ended up very, ended very awkwardly. So I, I think realistically, that was a very uh, temporary name change. But it, more than anything, just let me know that like I wasn't crazy. My resume was good. And as soon as I changed my name, I was getting responses. So strangely, it was this bittersweet, like, oh, okay, I'm doing the right things. I just need, it's just gonna take that one team to hire me full time. And it ended up being the Cardinals who had hired me previously as an intern that ended up hiring me again full time. And frankly, I don't know how long it would have taken if they hadn't taken that step because they knew me and they had hired me before. So they were the one team that was really open to it. Uh, maybe there were more, but not that I knew, you know, I was applying for a lot of jobs. People apply, people apply for two jobs and they get frustrated. I'm telling you, I applied for me, minimum, I don't know, minimum 20 to 30. Any team that posted a job, I was on it. So all that to say is um, it's kind of funny because now I've been hired by the Yankees. You know, in 2019, I think that received quite a bit of media attention, but that was easy relative to when I first got in the game in 2012, 13, that was extremely difficult and it was a whole different time. So it's, it was definitely difficult for me. It was definitely a dark time in my life, but it's really encouraging to see how far we've come where in 2013, I couldn't even get an internship, you know, and I was getting blatantly discriminated against. And in 2019, the Yankees hired me as a hitting coach. And you just think, I mean, change people think change happens slow but frankly like i'm living in the middle of just massive extremely rapid change i think so that was a really long answer but hopefully there were some gems in there no there definitely were and we're seeing it in a lot of different leagues whether it be the nba right like hiring uh, assistant coaches on their staffs but i will say that it is absolutely encouraging and inspiring because you know, you continuing to knock on the, the that door, or if you want to say the glass ceiling, like it opens the door for you to allow other women to walk through. So um, again, it's very, very encouraging and inspiring. Um, with any competitive person, there is a next step, an ultimate job. I know you, you mentioned earlier, you know, that when you started, you wanted to be a GM. Is that still the, the end game? Well, the end game is moving to New Zealand and being a sheep farmer, but that's a whole nother conversation. Okay. Uh, with the, the hey. I would say the short-term game is to, yeah, be a general manager. And as I mentioned earlier, it's like my passion really is not in the weight room. It's not even about hitting. It's it's really just about leadership and, and uh, cultural design and how to get a people, a group of people to work together towards a common goal. I think it's one of the most fascinating things in the world across all interest, industries, not just baseball. So. I'd like to be a general manager someday. Um, I have my hands completely full of being a hitting coach. So there's plenty, to learn, plenty to learn there, but it's a step in my journey to hopefully make my um, resume more robust and to be a true general general manager where I have an idea of sports performance and I have an, I have an idea of on-field performance. Definitely need to add some scouting into my repertoire. Um, but yeah, I. I I plan on being a general manager someday, and I think it's I think it's entirely possible. It's just a matter of, of when and and um, who will be giving me the opportunity. Love that. Uh, in a feature that I watched actually of Jessica Mendoza, you mentioned her earlier, and um, how, how you have connected later in your career. Um, you said that she asked you if it was your your dream job to be working with the New York Yankees, and you said. No, your dream job is to empower people and your vehicle is baseball. What do you hope your presence in the game of baseball inspires? And I guess, what do you foresee or hope for in the game of baseball in the future? Oh, uh, yeah, I've thought about that quite a bit, but I think in general, like, like you just mentioned, it's like, 
I was never a baseball fan. You know, I, I wasn't. And I, I don't have any qualms saying that. I love my job. I love working in baseball. I love working for the Yankees. It's been incredible. Um, but I'm not here because of baseball. I'm just here because this is an incredible vehicle and sports in general is an incredible vehicle. The Yankees are a very powerful uh, vehicle in sports um, to make change. And we see that with social issues. We see that with uh, making an impact in, in communities uh, for impoverished kids to, to create communities for them to be successful and to develop healthy relationships through sport. Um, I just think sports is this incredible breeding ground for so many different things. And so when I, when I think about baseball in a very long-term fashion as a general manager, what I would like to do is uh, create what the NBA has done with the WNBA with softball. You know, there's been a lot of fledgling, fledgling leagues that have popped up. Uh, Athletes Unlimited has just popped up recently with softball, but there's been nothing that has been super par- supercharged by the type of budget that the NBA has helped with the WNBA. And, and obviously there's still plenty to plenty of growth, you know, there obviously. Uh, but, you know, as you, again, change happens slowly. And as you look back like 20 years ago, what did the WNBA look like? It was nothing. Now we're seeing these, these athletes, especially powered by social media, like they're I mean, wow, you've seen incredible growth, incredible growth of the following, people paying a lot more attention, whether it's to the individual athlete themselves on social media, and then they kind of follow the team or who cares, you know, they're just getting more attention. So I think that can be done in the same fashion for softball. I don't know why it hasn't been done before. They draw a ton of crowds at the college level. And I think that people are interested, but we need to create a platform that's actually exciting. Um, Additionally, another thing I mean, I could, I could probably go on for an hour, but we're not going to do that. Another thing that I think about all the time is we are um, baseball again is made up of 50% Latin American players, and I've done I've spent quite a lot of time in uh, Latin America and the Dominican Republic, and it's I would you I'll use the word disturbing to me that I go there and it's like I've got three college degrees and I'm this privileged person from America and this privileged woman that I've gotten to uh, have a lot of opportunity through sports to the point where I'm coaching male professional athletes, you know, and I go there and I see young women there who do not have the same opportunities. So one of the things that I would love to do is create uh, sport academies in the Dominican Republic for young women that also align with MLB and maybe softball academies, who knows, um, so that the young women there have, have some kind of opportunity to, again, build those healthy relationships and learn all those great things that we talked about earlier through sport. So there's, there's so much to be done. There's so much potential. I'm, again, I could go on for a long time, but those are just two of the things that I think about that we can really use to use um, baseball as a vehicle to kind of propel those things. Well, I could actually listen for an hour because I, uh, when it comes to empowering young women to, uh, or young girls to become powerful women, I'm all on, all on board. Um, and that's what this platform is about, is about sharing the stories of women to hopefully inspire young girls or young women. So um, I have two fun segments. Uh, the, the next one is called It's a Vibe, all right? So what is something that you're really into right now that you would say is a vibe? <laughs> uh god what am i really into right now um I just, i'm gonna throw out tiktok into this okay. conversation i think tiktok gets a lot of heat from um i'm gonna say people who are our age i don't know how old you are but I don't, you're not 18 you know no. so no. so like i'm 33 and i think people are like oh tiktok but you know but there is some incredible creativity that's happening there and I started, I got on TikTok because I felt like I needed to reach a younger crowd and specifically younger women who ages 10 to 20, they're on TikTok, you know? And so if I'm thinking ahead 10 years, when I want to be a general manager, Instagram might be gone, you know, yeah. Facebook's kind of for old people now. And so Instagram is the, Instagram is the 25 to 35 yeah. and TikTok is like taking over the young people. So I'm, I'm really, I'm studying TikTok, but also there's just some, it is phenomenal to see people be creative on there uh and i i'm really into it I, i'm digging it i'm i'm learning more about it it's it's interesting it's fun so i'll say i'll say tiktok all right well yeah no it's very foreign to me i'm, I'm gonna be 28 next month and i have not touched tiktok i'm out of all the trends i don't know what's going on i just found <laughs> out that skinny jeans were out and I guess- <laughs> yeah i know i know the mom jeans coming back the flares i don't i can't yeah, uh, 
I, don't I think know. it's because I'm not on TikTok, so I'm not I'm not cool <laughs> or hip or with it, I guess. But okay, the next segment is a rapid fire. Okay, so I've got a couple questions. First one, and again, rapid fire, quick quick answers. What is your favorite women's sports moment ever? Oh, Brandi Chastain ripping her shirt off in the '99 World Cup. Duh, easy. Next one. Uh, that one's <laughs> that one's definitely been said. Um, trying to think. Kendall Coyne Schofield, the hockey player. She said that. Okay. Um, the your dream sporting event to attend. Um, I've I've been to this, but the College World Series uh, baseball tournament every year. I'm from Omaha, and it's kind of it's nostalgic, and it's there every year, and I just really love attending. I think it's I still think it's one of the best sporting events to go to. Okay. Uh, who is your softball goat? Kat Osterman, for sure. I was, I idolized her uh, growing up. So, and very cool again, to see her going to her third Olympics as I think she's 38. Incredible. Wild. All right. Your baseball goat. Hmm. I'm going to go with something a little different. I would say just more personally, Trevor Bauer is an interesting, a very uh, polarizing character, but I will say I've worked with him personally. I know him and he's just one of the most incredibly hardworking cerebral human beings. And he's also a genius with his personal branding and the way he takes care of um, himself from a business perspective. I think he's, I think he's the future of athletics in general. And I, yeah, I just think anyone who's maybe listening to this, somebody to follow and He's definitely, uh, like I said, he's definitely polarizing at times, but someone who's doing things very differently. All right, last one. What is your first sports memory? First sports memory is, I would say, playing, my first sports memory, honestly, is playing sports in my backyard with my sisters and my dad and my mom. That's awesome. All right, the last question, the show is called Major Keys. So what is a major key you would give to young women who look up to you or would like to follow in your footsteps? If you wanna follow in my footsteps, you would have to choose a very difficult path. And I would encourage that. Um, I might've been the first to do a couple of things or whatever, but there's still plenty of firsts to be had. And I just think that, you know, my, my advice these days is seek the difficult path. You know, don't take the handout. Don't, don't take, don't seek the easier way, seek the more difficult way, because even if it takes you longer, it's going to be more rewarding. And I think being an underdog is the most underrated advantage that there is. It's an advantage. It's a, if you get held down, I, I tell people, and I don't mean to be insensitive to anyone who is listening, who doesn't feel this way, but I'm glad I was discriminated against. It, it changed my life. It changed the way that I perceive things. I had to work harder. I had, I knew what I was up against and, and it, fueled me in some ways. And so I'm glad that happened, you know, and I'm glad that I persevered through it and that I didn't say, oh, well, that's not fair. I'm going to quit. I said, hmm, that's not fair. Like, don't get mad, get better. And I did. And because I had to do all that extra work, I'm still reaping the benefits of not only that difficult journey, but also literally the knowledge that I gained in my path, because I had to do so much more and be so much more meticulous about the um, career choices that I made. I am reaping the benefits of that tenfold now and it's gonna continue that way. And I'm not mad. I'm not mad that the pressure's on. I'm glad that people underestimate me. I'm glad they wanna hold me back. I'm glad, I'm very glad. And I think that my message to young women is don't, don't wish that it was easy because in the long run, you're gonna be miles ahead of people who had the easy route. Don't get mad, get better. I love that. Thank you so much, Rachel, for joining me. Again, I, th I think you are incredibly inspiring. And as you mentioned, just, you know, breaking down doors and breaking ceilings. And it's, you know, it's important. It's important for the next generation. It's important for women our age, right? Like to see that a woman can continue to persevere and get to the places that she wants to get to. So I'm excited to see you be a gen general manager in the future. Um, you know, maybe slide me a few tickets here and there. Like that would be <laughs> great. Uh, I'm here in Atlanta, so it would be for the Braves. But um, you know, <laughs> if you come to town, you know, uh, but we would love to have you here. So if you're a, a GM here, that'd be cool too. But again, thank you for joining me. I know you're in season. So um, thank you for taking the time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.
Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and do all the things, and I'll see you here next time on Major Keys. Keys, keys, keys. I